So today we are at Lock & Co. Now, if you look behind me, you can see that it's all about hats. Lock & Co itself was opened in 1676. This shop itself was opened in 1765. So when you go outside and you look at the building, it does kind of feel from another age, propped up by the Georgian buildings that flank it. So during the year, especially when the social season comes up, everybody's coming to Lock to get anything from uh, top hats to bowler hats, anything that's needed for Royal Ascot, Trooping the Colour, uh, Henley, uh, anything that kind of fits into the social season where a hat is required. So what we're going to do while we're here, in the oldest hatters in the world, I'm going to take you through the top five hats that you need to know about. So, as I'm sure you'll recognise, this is a top hat. Now, round the corner on the Strand in 1797, a man named John Hetherington invented what's referred to as the silk plush, and this is what this top hat is made out of. Most of the time these days you'll find top hats made out of rabbit felt, but the silk plush is particularly special for one particular reason, which is that the ones that exist made from silk plush, that's it, you cannot make it anymore. The reason you can't find it anymore is because the last loom that actually made them was based in France, in Lyon, and it was two brothers, Nicholas and Bobby Smith. Nicholas was being disinherited and got really upset, so set the factory on fire, and the machinery that made the silk plush was lost, and it has any attempts to reverse engineer thus far have proved futile, so you cannot find that anymore, but it does look absolutely tremendous. Uh, that being said, when you come to somewhere like Locke and you get the rabbit felt top hats, they're able to create something really beautiful for you. The top hat itself came into use in the kind of mid to late 18th century when the juste corps, which is the kind of uh, uh, overcoat that people would wear uh, during that period, and the tricorn went out of fashion and people started wearing morning coats and riding a lot. And so the top hat came into that. It was an amazing hat in the sense that it had no kind of social positioning and it was worn across the, the sort of social classes during, the, during that day. So you'll find anybody from chimney sweeps through to architects up to royalty wearing them. In terms of today, you'll mostly see them either at Royal Ascot or Trooping the Colour. Now, just a note on the materials with regards to hatting, there is also beaver. And beaver's interesting because an entire, I mean, an enormous industry was made in America of creating beaver felts that were shipped over to the UK because hats were such a huge business. The creation of beaver felt into hats was what drove a lot of men mad, so hence the term mad as a hatter, because mercury was used in the process and that caused a lot of problems for the people making it. Now onto this, speaking of way things are made, the bowler hat is an extraordinary, beautiful, iconic piece of kit that really speaks to the kind of cultural psychology around the UK, how people perceive us around the world. The bowler hat itself was invented in 1849, that is the same year that Huntsman opened up on actually New Bond Street rather than Savile Row where we know it is now, and it was also the year that the Corn Laws were abolished. So the reason it was created was Edward Cook in his estate in Holcomb Hall in Norfolk. His gamekeepers would be riding around the estate between drives wearing top hats like everybody else and the hats would keep getting knocked off because they were going through the woods. So bowler hats were made and designed to deflect branches as they were riding and they came to Locke who then went to Thomas Bowler who created the design that we know today. Interesting fact about the bowler hat on top of the history that I've already given you is that in shipyards the foreman of shipyards would often wear bowler hats as a sign of status, but actually also as a way of protecting themselves. Uh, shipyards back in the day, especially places like Ireland and Liverpool, were quite dangerous places. So the hats themselves would be lead lined just in case anybody was upset with the foreman and decided to bonk them on the head while they weren't looking. As for where to wear a bowler hat, there are very few places that now require a bowler hat as a dress code. However, if you go to the Cavalry Memorial Parade, you will see old officers of cavalry regiments wearing this while they march. Now, what the officers are wearing during Cavalry Memorial Parade is what's referred to as city dress. Now, city dress is the archetype of the British gentleman. It's a bowler hat, suit, 
an umbrella. There was also talk about the fact that the suit that they would wear, if it was pinstripe, you could tell which bank they would work for by the distance between the pinstripes, but that's a whole other story. This is one of my absolute favorite hats. It's called the Homburg. It was also known as the Eden because it was worn by Anthony Eden, Prime Minister of the UK, and probably the best dressed politician of all time. You can fight me on that. The other people that you would see wearing this would be Winston Churchill, very famously wore it a lot. And of course, uh, it was made famous in films uh, in The Godfather with Michael Corleone, who used to wear it, especially at the very end, as he goes to take out his brother-in-law. You have to answer for Santino, Carlo. This is your fairly standard fedora. I say fairly standard, actually it's a pretty iconic hat design. It was almost mandatory, it seems, when you look at images of the interwar years in America, people wore this pretty much throughout the day. It was useful because you can get into cars wearing it. And it was generally, I mean, hats were still something that gentlemen were kind of required to wear, or at least, it was in vogue to do so. It has a little brother, the Trilby, which just has different brim proportions. And ultimately there are different types of fedora that you'll see, whether it's a bash fedora that you might see made by someone like Nick Fouquet, where it's much bigger proportions. So ultimately there are lots of different variations of the fedora uh, and it's certainly the most popularly worn hat today and has been that for quite a while now. Another iconic hat design, this is the Panama hat. It's called the Panama hat, but it's actually made in Ecuador. What happened was that a lot of prospectors were going through Panama for trade routes, especially with regards to the California gold rush. And so in Ecuador, a man named Manuel Alfaro in 1835 set up a business creating these hats, knowing that when he sends them to the Panama Isthmus, there would be a huge clientele who would want to pick up these hats that were, were lightweight, able to keep people cool when they worked in that part of the world. So it only truly became world famous, especially in America, when in 1906, Teddy Roosevelt made a visit to the construction site of the Panama Canal and was photographed wearing this hat. It then was circulated around newspapers and magazines all over America and completely took off and is now the icon you know today. What's interesting about this particular one is that it is a collaboration between Lock & Co and Highgrove. And Highgrove, as you may know, is the very fond and long-standing home of King Charles III in the countryside where he has his gardens and it's a, it's a real sort of salute to his own love and fondness of nature and so the high grove colors are the ribbon around the crown and that's what made the panama interesting for people in the uk and popular because you could use the ribbons to represent your regiment or your club or your old school even in terms of where you would see this panama had been worn largely these days it's summer events like wimbledon henley anywhere that's kind of outdoors for an english summer occasion Before we go, I want to give a bit of a guide on fitting. Now, this contraption is what's known as a conformateur. It was invented in 1852 by Ali Meyal. So what the conformateur ultimately forms is the equivalent of a paper pattern uh, of the circumference of your head. Now, you may think that that is a fairly straightforward thing to do, but as per the wall of fame to my right, people's head shapes are extraordinarily uh, diverse uh, and everyone has their own unique shape around the head and the hat is really important to fit around that because you know it will be especially if it's hot uh, it will cause you to faint it will cause all sorts of problems if it doesn't fit particularly well if it's too tight and of course if it's too loose it will fall off so the conformateur is the solution to making sure it has the best fit possible so what happens is is this is placed over your head as per the image you'll see of it being done to the future emperor of Japan uh, at the point that he is the crown prince. A paper piece of paper will be slotted into here and when it's on the head, these spokes will be pushed out and these spikes around here will spread out to create the shape that's needed. The, so the top will be pushed down onto the pins and punch this piece of paper and then that will be cut round and that's, that's how you'll find the shape of the head uh, as best as humanly possible. And what that is is ultimately, it's a miniaturized version of a head because what you'll see from these small paper pens, they are small. And then what happens is it's reverse engineered using this, this is the familian. And these wooden spokes are then placed around the paper pattern. And then what happens is, is that it becomes very uneven because as I say, the head is all a different shape. And then this gets placed in the inside 
of the hat and then is shaped, the hat is shaped around these wooden spokes uh, and then that will then have the hat shaped to the circumference of your head. Hans, the Nicholas and Bobby Smith. Ooh, brilliant time. Okay, pinstripes, but that's a whole other story.